Let's move to the next slide and talk about something that's a little bit more ambiguous in terms of whether it's going to be good or bad for us. Neuroelectrical interfaces, or more commonly known as brain-computer interfaces. Now, I just wanted to clarify that when we say neuroelectrical, we actually mean any signal that has to do with our nervous system. So it's not actually just the brain. So it would include stuff to do with our muscles, our heartbeat is a neuroelectrical signal. If we move our fingers and we were detecting the electricity coming up through our arms, those are neuroelectrical signals too. And of course, the most prominent neuroelectrical signal that a lot of people like to talk about is stuff that comes from the brain, hence brain-computer interfaces. Now, in a sense, this is kind of the ultimate interface into uh, the human, because it bypasses everything and just goes straight to the source. So in the other sensors, the other modes of detection, the other interfaces, we would be either listening to sound, we'd be looking at where the eyes are going, we'd be looking at where the fingers are physically. So in the other types of biometrics that we had a look at, we would be looking at the results of neuroelectrical signals being sent throughout our body. So if our fingers or our arms were to have moved in a certain way, it would have come as a result of our brain sending out a signal through our nervous system, through our muscles, and then finally a button, a camera, a motion sensor would then detect that motion. And the detection of that physical change is the actual thing that triggers whatever it is in our system that's supposed to react to the human. So in other words, other biometrics are measured this way. It starts from the brain, goes through the nervous system, goes through the muscles, and depending on where those muscles are, we produce motion, we produce speech, eye movement, etc. And then external sensors then observe those physical changes, which we can then feed into our state tracking system. Now, the cool thing about neuroelectrical interfaces, or brain-computer interfaces, is we just go straight to the neuroelectrical signal. We don't wait to measure any physical changes. This is why sometimes people can refer to BCIs as a kind of a mind control thing, because it sometimes literally is mind control. And nerds like me love this concept because you can try and pretend to be a Jedi. Like you know how you like move things with just your mind. But this is actually a bit more profound than just useless geekery. Now, um, if you think about people that can't make the physical changes that those other senses detect. So let's say if we take uh, hand motion detection, for example. What if, what if you're paralyzed? What if you can't actually move your hand? Uh, let's even take it further than that. What if your hand is actually missing? What if it was cut off in an industrial accident? This is where BCIs can really have some utility. So these signals can be used to drive pretty much anything. It can be used to control wheelchairs. It can be used to, to detect finger motion, even if your fingers aren't actually there. And there are several instances of uh, BCIs directly being used to drive uh, prosthetics. Now, instinctively, um, this seems to be a little bit beyond our remit you know, in terms of us doing immersive design as immersive designers. But there is some merit in us uh, thinking about these kinds of things, D designing for inclusivity, for example. In other words, designing for disabled people. And we'll talk about that in depth in week eight. But for this week, it's just generally good to know what's available out there for us to be able to use uh, when designing experiences because we can actually create some really compelling experiences with BCIs. Now, when we were talking about facial tracking, we discussed uh, the affect synchronization and we were just proposing uh, assigning uh, feelings or tracking a user's state by looking at their face and how they're reacting to the environment, to the characters that we're presenting to them. With BCIs, we can directly detect what's actually happening. <laughs> so in essence, in the same way that we can use BCIs to allow our users to have a kind of mind control, uh, that very same ability can also allow us to actually read their minds, like in a quite literal sense.
Now, uh, we don't quite know enough about brain signals to be able to, you know, to visualize thoughts and project dreams onto a screen like some movies would indicate. But we don't really need the detection to be that level of fidelity to be useful to us as designers. Like, let's say even a simple uh, affordance like selecting objects or selecting modes uh, without having to move your arms or do anything other than have a thought that's that's already pretty powerful yeah so it's good to have this mode of interaction uh, in your radar because it could just be really useful to you uh, i guess we'll end talking about this slide by thinking about uh, direct sensory feedback using neuroelectrical interfaces uh, that's a super scary thought the simplest I can think of is uh, just giving someone a mild electric shock, like say in psychology experiments, to induce stress in people. But it could go a lot further than that. If we remember the movie The Matrix, not only were people sending thoughts to The Matrix to run their virtual avatars, The Matrix was also sending back thoughts in the same way that a computer would send back images into a head-mounted display, for example. It's just that instead of that signal having to go through our eyes and through our retina, it just goes straight to our visual cortex. And um, yeah, just think about that for a little bit. Uh, is that scary for you? Uh, do you like the idea? Maybe something to talk a bit more about when we get to week 8, hey? But let's stay on direct sensory feedback and move on to haptics. That's a bit less scary, isn't it? Now, haptic feedback seems to be the last thing that immersive designers think about. It seems to me the rank order of consideration starts from the visuals, and then it gets to the auditory, uh, and then um, the haptics is in there somewhere as a bit of an afterthought. And it might very well be a pragmatic decision because um, having good haptic feedback is actually quite expensive. The um, gold standard of haptic feedback would be just reality, right? You touch something, uh, it has the correct texture, it has the correct pressure. So if you touch a cup and you squeeze it, like a, it's proportional to what you would expect and uh, the, if it's a porcelain cup, like it has that nice porcelain feel uh, touch that you feel in your finger. And that's fine, I guess. Uh, if we go back to our restaurant example, you're making a restaurant and you need to have all those real objects for people to eat off of. So, you, you, yeah, it's built into the cost. But if we're talking about a narrative experience or a, like a fictional experience or a training scenario, like say in a flight simulator, for example, it's not practical to just have everything be real, but it's still pretty important to have some elements be real. So that's why we would use mixed reality in those situations as a pragmatic solution, I guess. So for example, with some flight simulators, they would actually use the exact same components as uh, the real cockpit of the aircraft, except that um, outside of the cockpit you'd have a screen, for example. So the student would basically be developing the same kind of muscle memory that they would be developing in the real aircraft, except uh, with none of the risks and none of the fuel costs, which is relevant these days. <laughs> And this is quite effective as a training tool already. In fact, it's so effective that you can actually have, uh, say, CASA certify a simulator for people to train on them and actually get uh, qualifications just by training on those simulators alone. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that later when we get to the ACE training center. But yeah, uh, mixed reality is a very useful tool for us immersive designers when uh, haptic feedback and fidelity in that area is really important to us. But in the cases where it's not really that important, where it's just basically adding extra sensory feedback or uh, extra icing on the cake, we can get away with simpler things. So the main haptic feedback that most people are familiar with these days would probably be what they get in their phones. 
and that's mainly used to convey uh, notifications and that kind of thing. So I'd say that's a bit of a stretch to say that's part of immersive design. But if I were to take you back to my childhood, which a lot of my examples seem to have come from, um, Nintendo 64 first introduced this thing called a Rumble Pack. Now you might recognize this name, Nintendo. Uh, they're a big games company with the current device being the Nintendo Switch. Now I'm going to ask the non-gamer people to just do their best to tolerate this a little bit because um, well, a studio like Nintendo is actually quite relevant in the immersive design space. They've made some really wonderful immersive experiences through their games. So you can't, you can't really just discount them because they deal in mass market products that are usually aimed towards children. Uh, they've actually made some quite significant contributions to our field. Uh, but anyway, they first introduced this thing called the Rumble Pack, which essentially was a device that would vibrate in coordination to what would be happening in the virtual experience itself, like on screen. So let's say if there was some kind of a monster dropping in from somewhere high or stamping onto the ground, the, the Rumble Pack would vibrate. And this might seem a little bit gimmicky, and I guess even back then it kind of was. Uh, but if, if you were to combine this with the visual feedback and the auditory feedback, and then also the haptic feedback, it, it actually creates a pretty compelling experience, which is why I think it's survived for this long. Now, when we look at any typical VR hand controller, like say for the Oculus Quest, or even um, you know the Vive or the Pico, they have the same uh, vibration motors, they have the same feedback. And even though it started as a bit of a cheap trick, it's still relevant enough to be included in contemporary platforms. And uh, as designers, my attitude is, if it's there, why not use it? We should also be more aware of more advanced haptic feedback solutions and there is no shortage of those. I guess the issue with them is that they're slightly more expensive. Now, I guess if you're designing for a specific client that already have these devices available, then uh, maybe it doesn't matter so much. But if we were designing for the general consumer and um, putting software up, let's say, on the Oculus Quest store, then we don't have this available to us. Not yet, anyway. Uh, designing a general haptic solution especially in the virtual space, is quite a challenging thing to do because you're basically trying to create something from nothing. And I guess we could fake that sensory experience by writing directly to our brains, but we've already established that we don't have that ability just yet. So what are we left with? We're left with proprietary and pretty expensive solutions. Let's take, for example, the Touch Haptic Device by 3D Systems. Uh, um, as far as I can tell, there are two main applications for this device. Uh, but essentially, it's just a kind of a stylus or a pen. But on the other end of it are a bunch of resistive motors. So it can simulate actually going up against something. So this is really useful for sculpting, like pretending that you're sculpting cl clay uh, so it can have pretty convincing sensory experience by just like uh, simulating the resistive qualities of clay. That's if you're using a, kind of a clay stylish or a clay brush or something like that to sculpt the clay. And um, you can also apply the same logic by simulating a scalpel. So surgical students would use this, you know, in addition to more traditional medical training which would usually involve things that are a bit more expensive and a bit more risky, like, you know, real blades, cadavers, maybe even real patients. I guess you could also use something like this uh, as part of a cooking simulation too. Yeah, I, I don't know, That's a, you can think of lots of ways to utilize this kind of thing, but you have to balance that with the cost. So if we're thinking about cooking training, then maybe it'd be more efficient to just actually get people to cook for real instead of um, spending money on a device like this, which is quite expensive. Now, if this is something that you're interested in trying out, I think um, 
Uh, mechanical engineering has a few of these devices. I remember this being mentioned in one of the meetings in that uh, 4D surgery project that I'm on. So maybe we can organize uh, give a little bit of a tryout if you want. But moving on, uh, there are also some uh, glove-based solutions. It's a little bit more general. So uh, the, the touch TM haptic device is really just useful for things that have a, a handle, kind of like a stylus analogy. The application for a glove device would be a little bit more general, like I said. So, um, you know, holding fruit, uh, touching a wall, playing piano, just a little bit more general. And the popular way of achieving this at the moment seems to be using some kind of resistive motor and uh, Basically, they just attach it to every f single joint in your fingers. It, it looks quite crude, so these devices aren't quite ready for prime time, but it's interesting to note them for us to use in the future. Or you might even use them now if you can get your hands on a prototype. But that's if you're really, really determined not to use mixed reality. It's probably just a bit easier to use mixed reality, at least from an implementation standpoint. But while we're on the topic of resistive motors, there is one viable mode that's coming up soon that would be interesting to us as immersive designers, and that's the PlayStation VR hand controller that's coming with a PlayStation VR 2 kit. This is going to be a VR add-on for the PlayStation 5 console. And it's kind of like an El Cheapo version of like the glove-based solutions that we've been talking about, or even mixed reality but it's also a slightly more refined solution than just the vibration motors that we currently have on the current VR uh, hand controllers. And it's essentially just the same idea as the PS5 controllers except put into a virtual reality controller. And there's just a physical resistance motor that's attached to the triggers. Uh, it can do some precise resistance and some precise uh, types of vibrations and it seems to do a good enough job of replicating uh, some textures and some sensations that we haven't really been feeling in a consumer level device. So maybe this is the direction that contemporary VR hand controllers are headed, at least before the end of the decade or when we work out how to directly implant sensations into our brains just like in the matrix. Okay, let's spend the next 12 or so minutes looking at some case studies. In the previous slides, we had a look at eye tracking, face tracking, uh, BCIs and uh, haptics in, in general, although we did mention a few specific examples. Uh, but we can now have a look at how these different things have come together and combined into a perceptible entity. So this could come in the form of a consumer product that's manufactured. In the case of the Oculus Quest department, it's actually a YouTube video. Uh, and what that represents is really a full immersive design solution. And I guess my goal for these case studies is just to see how all those different elements can be combined in, into an immersive design solution. So let's start with the HP Reverb G2 Omnicept. Geez, that's a mouthful. I guess this is a lesson in naming conventions in more ways than one. This headset is part of the Windows Mixed Reality umbrella. So just note that this is distinct to when we say mixed reality in general, where we mean real objects are combined with virtual objects. And when we say Windows Mixed Reality, that's just Microsoft branding the term mixed reality. It's also kind of like when Meta tries to take over the word metaverse. Just something to be careful of. Anyway, there's three things of note about the G2, in my opinion, anyway. Uh, well, I guess one, we haven't really talked about this too much, but it has a really high resolution display compared to other displays in the past. And it's what we would term as almost retinal resolution. Retinal resolution would essentially be the same resolution as what we would be able to detect with our eyes any higher than that and we wouldn't perceive any better quality 
The G2 is not quite there, but it's almost there. So displays like this is where you'd start to be able to read text in a book without having to zoom into it really, really closely. Now, I guess in two years' time, it's not really going to be a big deal, kind of like in the same way as HDTVs aren't really a big deal these days, but we're not quite at that point yet, so it's still worth mentioning, but increasingly becoming less relevant. The really interesting parts about the G2 are the extra biometrics that come in the eye tracking and the heart rate sensor. If your experience needs accurate gaze detection using gaze vectors, the G2 isn't a bad option. You've also got some rudimentary uh, neuroelectrical sensors that comes in the form of a heart rate sensor. So if you were designing for corporate training experiences, maybe the G2 would be an option for you as a mode of interaction. Again, I want to caution everyone that we're not really interested in specific hardware products. The interesting thing about this one is the combination of sensors that's available to us to be able to use as immersive designers. So if somewhere down the line you were to see another product that has the same combination and maybe a little bit cheaper, then maybe you might consider that as an option. Okay, let's look at haptics. And that's just how I pronounce that spelling. We're not talking about haptics in general. We're talking about the actual company spelled hapt and then x. So again, we're not really interested in this specific device or specific company. We're just interested in how they've implemented haptics. So the question we should be asking ourselves is, what kind of data are they taking from the user? What kind of sensory feedback are they giving back to the user? And what kind of applications is this combination actually good for? As of March 2020, Haptics' latest solution is their development kit 2. And let's just go through it really quickly because we're running out of time. What kind of data does it take from the user? It has a hand position, orientation, and then it also has the same thing for each finger. So the thing to note about this particular tracking system is it uses magnetic motion tracking. This is quite a bit more accurate than the others that we've seen so far. For example, the Vive Knuckles controllers only uses capacitive touch, so it has some kind of idea of how far your finger is away from the controller. It gives you a general shape, but it doesn't actually give you accuracy. So uh, um, just taking this from their website, they claim sub-millimeter precision. Now you don't really need that kind of accuracy if you're just playing a game and pushing virtual buttons, but you might need that kind of accuracy if you're feeding back your hand information into a robot. And not just any robot, a robot that you expect to be able to similarly do the same tasks as your actual hand needs to do. Like uh, pick up a cup without crushing it or play with a Rubik's Cube. Now when we think about the task of actually picking up a cup without crushing it, we're not just actually using the position of our fingers, we're also tracking how much pressure we're putting onto the cup using our fingers. We need to make sure that we're putting enough pressure on it that we actually grip it, and when we move our hand we end up picking it up, but not so much pressure that we actually end up crushing the cup. And I'll add a little caveat here that we're talking about soft plastic cups or paper coffee cups, not the glass cups. I, I guess it's still quite relevant for the glass cups because uh, robot hands can crush it quite easily. So if you think back to just accurate finger tracking, if we were to make a fist and there was no sensory feedback about how much pressure the robot arm is actually putting onto the object that it's grabbing, then we'd probably just end up crushing whatever it is that the robot hand is holding. But the cool thing about haptics is it also gives you back some force feedback, some pressure feedback. So it more or less replicates what you would be doing just with your normal hand without the robot in between. Now, of course, it doesn't have to be a robot on the other end. It could also be a completely virtual character. So let's say if you are in a virtual reality environment and you were to go ahead and hold an apple in that environment, this solution will also make you feel that apple as if it's actually there. You don't have to pretend that the apple is there and stop yourself consciously from uh, making a full fist. The glove will actually stop you. 
from making a full fist as if the apple was there. The other cool thing to note about this solution is it actually has tactile feedback points uh, attached to your skin. So it can replicate the texture of whatever you're touching, say, let's say a, a grooved button or a grooved uh, knob or something like that. So unfortunately, we don't have an example of this on campus just yet, but we'll see if we can get one. Looks really, really cool. And mega, mega expensive. Let's talk about something that's not expensive. So the MetaQuest 2, or just the Quest in general, is one of the most accessible standalone virtual reality headsets available to the consumer at the moment. We did cover it a little bit in week one, and one of the interesting things about the Quest solution is that it can use its SLAM cameras, and let's just remind ourselves that SLAM stands for simultaneous localization and mapping. So this is how the Quest is able to know its physical location within the real world, so then it can use that data maybe in a virtual reality environment to be able to track itself nicely. In addition to knowing the headset's location, we can also use the SLAM cameras to actually track the user's hands. So we don't necessarily need to use the Quest's uh, hand controllers. But the disadvantage of this is you're not holding anything. You essentially just give up any kind of tactile feedback in exchange for more accurate hand, rep yeah, hand representation. But this is only true if you're using completely virtual objects. What if you match every virtual object to a physical object in the real world? So that's exactly what this dude in this YouTube video did. He mapped every table, every wall, reproduced it in the virtual reality world, and then matched the locations, like basically aligned them. And once that's finished, he could actually just walk around in his apartment with the virtual reality headsets on and add you know, all sorts of uh, embellishments to his environment, but still touch the real objects. He doesn't need a super expensive HAPT-X glove system to give him tactile feedback. It's the actual real objects that's giving him the tactile feedback. Now, I suppose an apartment and a bunch of furniture isn't really that cheap either, so uh, I guess it depends on what you want to prioritize. Yeah. Anyway, this is a classic example of mixed reality design. Use real objects in conjunction with virtual objects and that's basically the classic definition of mixed reality. And essentially that's what all the rest of the case studies are based on. Incidentally, I think I've been talking for a bit more than an hour for this lecture, so I'm gonna try and wrap it up. Zero Latency, The Void, and the ACE Training Center, they all use mixed reality techniques to create their simulations. The zero latency format is essentially just a big warehouse where you have one-to-one -one, uh, spatial environment so you can pretty much walk without using any locomotion solutions. They also give you a toy gun so you can feel like you're holding a real gun. The void, although they are no longer functioning at the moment, maybe they'll come back later. But the void is essentially the same thing except they add walls and then they also add like heaters and fans to make you feel uh, temperature and wind and stuff like that. So you could have a situation where you're looking out into a cliff and that cliff is looking over a river of lava and there'd be like a heater blowing at you but since you had the headset on it looks like you're standing over, I don't know, like a, a hellscape. And that's a really cool, powerful experience, but done really cheaply and safely. <laughs> the ACE Training Center again is ticking it up a notch. And um, I guess one thing I'll say is one of the simulators there is so good that CASA, the Civil Aviation and Safety Authority here in Australia, will give you a certificate if you qualified on that simulator for that particular aircraft. Teresa told me not to talk too much about the ACE Training Center because you guys cover it in 9901. Uh, but yeah, I just thought I'd mention it because they're, they're really cool.
and um, that's the end, even though we're a little bit over time. Thank you for listening.